The Other Side of Fear, A Backpacker's Memoir by Jenny Revis. Unhidden Heroin Series, Book Number One. Chapter 13, Sherry Ann Carson. Right before lawn season ended, I was mowing in a neighborhood in Yukon when a lady came out of the rental property where I was working. I had no idea who the owner of the place was because I was hired by another regular customer to go mow it once a week and would send him an invoice for it. She informed me that she was the owner of that property and the others, that she was also the owner of a bar named Edna's that her mother had started decades ago. I had never heard of it. Have you ever bartended? She asked me. Not officially, but I have always mixed drinks at parties, and I've been told that my drinks are the best, I said. It's easy to learn, and I'm happy to teach you everything you need to know. A liquor license is cheap and easy to get. I am looking for a daytime bartender on Saturdays and Sundays. Would you be interested? This literally landed in my lap in perfect timing. I had just enough time to train before the service industry got busy for the holidays. This ended up fitting like a glove. I loved bartending. I was really good at it and the money was great. The regulars who came in there had been regulars for years and they were very generous with how they tipped me. They sometimes brought me food. The woman who had come out of the rental property that day to ask me about my interest in bartending was Edna's daughter, Tammy. Edna wasn't able to run the business anymore because of Alzheimer's, but I had the pleasure of meeting Edna and hearing a bit about her story. She started Edna's in 1989 with her mother and when they first opened their doors, Edna's brother came from Texas to hang a dollar on the wall to wish her the best of luck for her new business. From that point on, a trend began for customers to hang dollars to commemorate special moments. After nearly 30 years of that, every space of the walls and ceiling were completely covered with dollar bills that had special notes, names, or pictures sketched on them by customers who wanted to leave a piece of them with Edna's forever. When I met Edna, I knew she wasn't herself because of how her mind disease had begun to take over, but her real essence still shone through. One day, she and Tammy came in to bring some kitchen supplies, and I asked Edna if there was a motto or a favorite quote that denoted her values that she ran her business by. She said, girl, my bar has always been a place where everyone gets treated equally. It doesn't matter where people come from. When they walk in here, they are home and they are treated equally in my bar. The owner's nephew was supposed to work with me as security, kitchen help, etc. But if he ever did show up, he showed up stoned and was usually useless on the job. When it was busy, it got crazy being, being busy, being the only person there to make drinks, wash dishes, and also make food. Sometimes I would have my bar top full, patio full, and a group of 10 people walk in for a wedding party or something and every single person wanted food. With one hand, I made hamburgers, chicken wings, fried pickles, nachos, and with the other, I poured drinks and ran the register. At the end of my shifts, I was spent, but I always had a fat wad of cash in my pocket and drinks waiting for me on the other side of the bar. I became close friends with everyone that worked there. I became close friends with everyone while working there, and we were all like a family. Plus, it was so much fun. I ended up working more day shifts and it, put, and it pulled me through my off season perfectly. In my off season, my lawn customers also had odd jobs for me, like house sitting and pet sitting for holiday vacations, deep cleaning for holiday parties, hanging Christmas lights, helping organize spare rooms and garages, translating documents or websites into Spanish for their businesses, trimming trees or painting their spare bedrooms. Then. On one boring Saturday that seemed the same as all the rest, I was lighting my first cigarette after opening the bar for another day when I heard the front door open and someone sit down at my bar top. An unfamiliar voice ordered a Coors Light and when I turned around to see what face went with it, I met Sherry Ann Carson. I was frozen. She was the most beautiful lesbian I had ever seen. The gay community in Oklahoma City was small and I had definitely never seen her out anywhere in gay town. I also discovered that I was very shy with women and had not fully explored that part of me since I had only had a relationship with one woman thus far. I pretended like everything was normal and avoided eye contact while serving her beer to avoid any awkward attempts of extra communication. She started coming in regularly, and I found out she was a friend in the group of my regular customers. I followed this routine of ignoring her presence until one day when my shift was ending, all of her friends tabbed out and left, but she stayed. I had my back facing the bar while I, was, while I counted down my drawer. 
but in the mirror above the register, I could see Sherry with her chin resting on her hand, propped up by her elbow, watching me do my shift closing duties. Fuck, she's totally going to try to talk to me. Then I heard it. Do you have anything going on when you get off? My palms started to sweat and my throat closed up. I pretended like I was so surprised, like it was the first time I'd ever had any engagement with her, caught off guard and clueless about why she was asking. Oh, I've had several invites to go do stuff, but I still haven't decided which one I'll be a part of, I informed her. I was, never was good at game playing. What were the rules? Was I supposed to play hard to get? Hmm, why do you ask? Well, I was going to see if after your shift you'd like to sit on this side of the bar and let me buy a drink. Inside of me, I felt party balloons and confetti go berserk. My legs were shaking. Sure, a free gamer sounds cool, I nonchalantly said. But when I turned back around to finish counting my drawer, nobody could see me grinning from ear to ear. During the first round of drinks at Edna's, we agreed that we were hungry. So she took me to our favorite food place called Cousins, another classic Oklahoma City place that was well known for its fantastic food and bar service. We discovered how many things we had in common. The coolest connection was that she went to Cozumel every year to go diving, and Cozumel was the island where I had lived at 19 years old. Our conversation never broke stride until the bartender called out for last call, and we realized we had been there in that conversation for six straight hours. She took me back to my car, we had a steamy goodnight kiss, and the rest is history. I had no idea, when I went to work that day at the bar, that I would meet the person I would spend nearly five years in a relationship with and that this person would so immensely impact and empower my life in such a positive way that it would change my destiny forever. Randy drifted back into my life and we agreed to be roommates in my house until since we already knew each other. He was a huge help running my business. We worked out a deal from his pay. We worked out a deal with his pay from working and the rent at the house. I was there at my house working with him Monday through Thursday, and then each Thursday night I would pack a bag to go stay with Sherry through the weekend. Gracie was miserable with this arrangement because she hated to share a space with all of Randy's cats. On top of my lawn business and working weekends, I still juggle classes. After a few months of this dance, Sherry suggested that Gracie and I move in with her. If you totally rent out your house and have Randy run the business from that property, you will free yourself of so much burden. Then you can focus on finishing school and moving forward with your goals and dreams. She was right. My house and my business weighed me down a lot. Like I was treading mud for so long. I was so tired. I had been tired for so long, but I was never still long enough to let myself acknowledge just how much. I trusted Randy to run my business. All my customers knew him and loved his quality of work. He knew my lawn routes and he was trustworthy. We talked out details and everyone agreed that it seemed like a perfect fit for him to take the house furnished and me to transition a few of my basic belongings and Gracie to Sherry's cozy little house. Randy was happy to live alone and we agreed that I would work with him only one or two days a week on the heaviest days while I took a full-time semester at UCO so that I could be on track to graduate the following spring. Finally. My job at Edna's came to a screeching halt when the owner made big changes that forced my regulars to go elsewhere. That cut my income down to about one-fourth of what it had been. I chose to let go of my job and just focus on school and working part-time for my business, focusing mainly on the administrative part of it. It was a great setup, at least to finish out that lawn season, and then we could recalibrate over the holidays to figure out what needed to be adjusted for the following spring. It seemed to work really well until suddenly it didn't. When I was halfway through a crazy full semester with five classes on my shoulders, Randy's train went off the tracks. He was angry all the time, which was his normal way of being, but this time it was different. He stopped answering my calls and texts. I let it coast for a couple of weeks because I knew him well enough to know that sometimes he would be totally reclusive and incapable of connecting with the outside world. I understood him because I was often the same way. Then I started getting calls from customers. Randy had stopped mowing. I thought he had died. I immediately drove over to the house one day to find out what was going on, expecting to find a murder scene upon entering my house. I hadn't been over there in quite a while. When we worked together, he had just picked me up from Sherry's. When I walked through the front door, this awful, rotten stench just about knocked me off my feet. I carried on, gagging, stuffing my mouth full of the tail of my shirt to find Randy alive but extremely sick, buried under blankets on my living room floor. There were dozens upon dozens of cats in my house. I recognized his kitties from when I met him in the apartment complex. He had those cats for years, 
and had moved th them with him from California to Oklahoma when he took the job as a manager at the apartment complex where we had met. But he started to hoard cats. Strays from outside, strays that he found while working in other parts of town. They were inbreeding, and many were sick. They were on top of furniture, hiding in corners, hiding under furniture and in kitchen cabinets. There was urine, feces, and vomit everywhere matted in the carpet, and they had urinated into the air registers on the floor, so those were now full of cat urine. Every time the system kicked on for either heat or air conditioner, the poisonous toxins would get blown out of the vents and fill the house. That's what had made Randy sick. The cats also sprayed everything. Every piece of furniture was saturated with cat spray. In my master bedroom, I had a queen-size bed with a beautiful comforter and pillows, a matching curtain that covered the door leading to the patio outside my room, and everything else in the room also matched. All of it was completely ruined. All the furniture in my guest room was completely ruined. In the closets where I stored spare clothes for different seasons, my winter clothes with heavy coats and sweaters, an assortment of dress clothes for interviews and presentations with different colored heels, and my box of jewelry that mixed and matched with each dressy outfit was all ruined. All my clothes either had a yellow hue to them from the toxins in the air or had been directly sprayed on. All my boxes of books from years of university coursework, my extra towels and bedding and boxes of other things on spare closets, my kitchen cabinets and everything in them were all ruined. The cats had wandered in and out of all the cabinets high and low and urinated or pooped on everything. There were even dead cats inside of my couch. And I discovered that when some of his favorite cats died of a lung infection, all the cats were sick. He put them in the freezer because he couldn't let them go. Randy was sick, completely incapable of functioning. He had stopped going to work. My lawn schedule was now more than two weeks behind and there was no way I could drop everything I was doing to catch up. Not with my class load in the middle of midterm exams and presentations. I couldn't. I simply couldn't. The iron statue finally broke. My lawn books were a mess. My finances were a mess. My house was ruined. My cup was empty. I was done. My house was going to cost several thousands of dollars to fix, money that I obviously didn't have. There was no point in suing Randy. He was broke and mentally ill on top of it. I didn't want to live in that house again and would have to spend thousands to make it rentable. I wanted out. I was so tired. With the only money I had left in my, my hand, I could either pay one more mortgage payment and then figure out how to keep chasing money during the winter or invest it in a bankruptcy and wash my hands of it all. I chose the latter. I walked out of my bankruptcy hearing with my Jeep Liberty and the few belongings I already had at Sherry's, including Gracie. I lost everything else. My truck, my lawn equipment, my house, everything I had nearly sold my soul for over five years of sweating and bleeding to dig myself out of holes. All the overtime I had worked at so many different jobs to chase payments for these things was money that I could have just put into a shredder. This was all a new rock bottom for me. And I sunk into a suicidal low where I would teeter for months. I relived the power from my rape like it had happened just the day before. After those traumas, when I was 20 and my collapse into drugs afterward, the way that I had pushed forward with work, school, home, and my business was symbolic to me of the power I was trying to get back. I had been building a castle, but I had built it on a cracked foundation by not doing the inner work to heal wounds and reconcile the broken pieces inside of me. I just kept stacking more and more shit on top of it until one day the Jenga tower had to tumble. I also realized that I had made those outer accomplishments as a major part of my identity. So when I lost them, I had no idea who I really was. Living with Sherry was a choice while I rented out my house, but it became the only place I had to go after my bankruptcy, and once again, I felt like I was on the verge of homelessness. I felt terribly vulnerable. It meant trusting her to provide for me during an incredibly different, difficult time. Anytime I would let anyone try to do that in the past, they hurt me somehow. A rug would get pulled out from under my feet. Sherry and I had met in the bar scene, and that's where we made our home. After my bankruptcy was finalized, I delved more deeply into a world of booze than I ever thought possible. I was convinced that as long as I never blacked out, got abusive, or got a DUI, that I didn't have a problem, and that it didn't cause problems with anyone else either. I never wanted to be present. I couldn't face anything that was going on outside, especially not inside of me. I was hellishly destructive with everyone and everything around me. 
Sherry had gotten me a connection for a job at a Ritzy restaurant in Oklahoma City via her friendship with the general manager of one of the locations. And the night before I was supposed to officially finish my orientation, Sherry and I were wasted at a house party. Two guys at the house pulled me into the bathroom where they had lines of coke. I had never officially done coke before. Sherry walked into the bathroom right as we were finishing our lines and shit hit the fan, giving way to a screaming match as I drove us home drunk. I was up all night long, enjoying the little bit of coke those guys had sent home with me. When Sherry got up, saw the baggie, and discovered that I had blown off my last day of orientation, we got into another huge fight. And this is when intervention came for me at this new rock bottom. I am willing to empower you in any way I can so that you can make it to the other side of this, but I will not enable you to destroy your life. If you don't make a change, then you have to find somewhere else to go. It was the same weekend that I went to my friend Brittany's house to tell her about my crazy fuck ups. She always listened and never judged. We had met in a management class in our final stretch of undergraduate coursework and were always hanging at her house doing housework together doing homework together and drinking vodka or whiskey on her balcony. We were on her patio drinking, and while I was swirling my ice cubes around in my crown royal, she said, Your 20th birthday is coming up. What do you think about, what do you think your 30s will be like? What do you want to be different then? Jesus, her question made me look, truly look at my life and be honest about how it felt to be alive, both in the past and in that moment. And it terrified me. Tears started to fall, and then they started to flood. I had kept myself busy for so long, I never had time to look inward. Or feel. It hurts too much to think about living until my 30th birthday, I confessed. That truth spoken out loud scared us both. After I had given my all to build a home on the outside and everything had crumbled, I realized nothing would change in my life until I began to look inward to rebuild the home on the inside. The foundation of building something magical both on the outside and on the inside was me. My, belief, my belief systems about myself. As long as my foundation was cracked, anything I tried to build on it would fall. This was my light bulb moment. On the balcony, over that glass of Crown Royal, I finally admitted that no matter who came into my life to break pieces, it was ultimately my responsibility to put them back together. And until I started doing so, nothing about my life would ever change.